Grand Sage Bullock, son of Gartrek, has some huge shoes to fill. Following former Grand Sage Illich's failed expedition to Terra, the Council of Sages of Planet Nemesine lost face in the eyes of the Galactic community. His race, the Chanarai, once known as the Mind Flayers of Planet Nemesine, due to their unrivaled telepathic abilities, had become a laughingstock overnight. Translated from standard Nemosian, a single failure. That's all it took for everybody to turn against us. A single failure. Bullock pondered thus, as he made his way to the testing labs recently set up on Terra, with a more than generous contribution from the Nemosian Council of Sages. Their own reputation had taken a death blow following Illich's fall from grace, so they opted to save face the best way they knew how. The powers that be determined that Illich and his group had botched the operation, due to lacking adequate knowledge of Terra and the human race as a whole, They'd gone in guns a-blazing, so to speak, possessing but a tenuous grasp of human history and customs. Therefore, it was little wonder that dishonorable quack had humiliated himself and his entire race, thereby flushing over a hundred thousand cycles of renown and goodwill down the proverbial crapper in a matter of days. Brows furrowed. Bullock steeled himself. He would restore the honor of the Chanarai, or die trying. Ignoring the warnings of his superiors, the young man requested, more like pestered, the Council of Sages for funding and resources to continue Illich's work. The Council, in its infinite wisdom, refused the request the first 10,000 plus times it was made. It only acquiesced due to pressure from the Imperial Scientist Guild of planet Argrios, Eumenopolis and center of power of the Luconian Empire. The not so benevolent overlords of the Chanarai and trillions of other races spread throughout the galaxy. Like the Council, the Guild has suffered undue humiliation after Illich's disastrous outing. Already renowned for his ruthlessness, Chief Scientist Zelek Amduisis, leader of the Guild, threatened to have Bullock, his team, and their entire family summarily executed, should they meet with similar failure. That was it, then. Bullock would succeed where his predecessor had failed. Otherwise, he would slash open his own belly and let the gods do as they willed, with whatever would be left of him. Following the pleasantries de rigueur, Bullock and company were ready to begin their sounding of the human mind. Under the care of Seventh Scientist Alcor, son of Simric, this first test would catalogue the minds of a division of humans called African Americans. Once they learned their centuries long history on terror, the scientists opted to divide their testing pool according to age groups children, teenagers, adults, and elderly. Alcor's first subject had been an odd neurodivergent young man residing in an area derisively termed the Bible Belt located at the south of the former United States of North America. The young man had been closely followed and observed by Alcor's team as he went about his daily life and work. Everything had gone as planned. Having learned from Illich's mistakes, Bullock and company would finally obtain the answers they sought. They got more than they bargained for. No sooner had Bullock and the rest logged on to the thought projector that would allow them to see into subjects' minds at the same time Alcor and his team did thus, the first complications arose. Rather than ponder a concrete topic or concept, the human mind was singing, a tendency common to humans and other lesser races. However, the subject did not use his oral orifice or vocal cords to exert sound. Rather, he did so with his mind. Soon as they were plugged in, Bullock and company were bombarded by a nonsensical statement. I'm a Bobby girl in a Bobby world. Life in plastic. It's fantastic. You can brush my hair. Undress me everywhere. Imagination. Life is your creation. Much to their astonishment, the subject then switched to another melody, sung in a language altogether different from English, the most widespread Terran language. This tune made still less sense than the previous one. O mio babino caro, mi place bello, bello, for andrasse in porta rossa, a compare an angelo. Si, si, si voci andare, e si la masse indarno, andre su ponte vihino, ma per batarmi inano, mi struggo et me tormento, o dio for e mori. Babo pita, pita, babo pita, pita. Further research later revealed this song, written over 110 years ago, and dealt with the plight of a young human female, desirous to wed a male of her age group, notwithstanding the opposition of her parental unit. Especially troubling was the segment where the aforementioned girl threatened to throw herself into an Arno, should her father refuse her his blessing. 
The rest of the initial assessment went much the same. Alcor and his team had followed the proverbial rulebook without fail or deviation, yet at least 80 of the 100 or so humans they examined exhibited similar behaviours. Of particular note was an elderly janitor whose mind repeatedly stated a most bizarre desire. Despacito, que repetula despacito, desacuda diga cosa no, para que uates si no esta conmigo. Try as they might, Bullock and the rest couldn't decipher what a despacito was, let alone why that particular human would want to inhale one. They assumed it was a long extinct narcotic humans were want to abuse, and thus opted to settle the matter at some other time. Next up was a human female child who went about her daily tasks, singing about strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Trees described as blood on the leaves and blood of the root, bearing of scent of magnolia sweet and fresh, commingled with the sudden smell of burning flesh. Bullock later on did some research on that tune. The knowledge he acquired would haunt him for the rest of his life. He wisely withheld it from the rest of the team. Bullock and company were at a loss. The rest of the experiment promised to be just as erratic and inconclusive as that of Illich. If this continued, they would have no choice but to take their own lives to spare their family's dishonour and reprisals from Amduisas and the Guild. However, just when everything seemed lost, Bullock had an idea. Translated from standard Nemosian, Do not be disheartened, comrades. I believe our enterprise would benefit from a change of perspective. Our predecessors met with failure because they assumed the minds of humans would be little different from those of other races. Instead, I offer the following hypothesis. Human minds are incapable of being catalogued as those of other races. Rather than an evolutionary flaw or a fortuitous accident, this characteristic is endemic to the human race as a whole. This primitive race has thrived and survived on their death or terror precisely because their minds allow for so much variance and adaptability. Following some deliberation, the group wholeheartedly accepted this proposition and revised their methodology accordingly. Now, some two cycles later, Bullock would present his findings before Chief Scientist Amduisas, the Imperial Scientist Guild, and the Nemosian Council of Sages. Try as he might, the Grand Sage couldn't quite dismiss a strange melody he'd read within a subject's mind. Quantos termina es futurus, quanto idox adventurus, conca stricte descarius. The chief scientist wasn't known for his compassion or understanding, so Bullock figured it was all too fitting, all things considered. Still, he'd taken precautions for any adverse turn of events, thereby guarding his family and those of the scientists under his leadership. Only time would tell if it had been enough. <laughs>